our women's discipleship house here tonight, our ladies uh, from our women's discipleship house. And then we have a graduate from the discipleship house, and she's going to share her testimony. Uh, I, we always talk to them about being ready in season and out of season to share the, the hope that's in them, right, like the scripture says. And, and uh, Hannah, would you come up here, sister? Uh, Hannah Gonzalez is a graduate. Um, just so proud of her. She shared her testimony numerous times, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a barn burner. It's hard to preach behind her. But um, I just I asked her to come and share and um, just her heart and what God is doing in her life, just a brief testimony. But, but I hope that you're listening. I hope that maybe you have someone in your family that, that is um, strayed or someone that you know that maybe you've given up on that you can be encouraged after this to reach out to. And maybe uh, we have information on, on the table outside how people can apply to enter the program or uh, if you want to know more about what we do, there's some brochures and stuff out there at the table. So I'm going to pray for you, sister. I'm going to let you, let you take care of business, okay? All right, Father, we thank you, Lord, today for Hannah, and I just pray for Hannah right now. Uh, she's such a sweet woman of God, and you've used her in such a mighty way, and I just pray over her, Lord. I pray, God, that you give her freedom. Uh, I know she's going to do a good job, and I pray that what she says will not fall on deaf ears. Maybe there's somebody out here that has given up hope, and tonight, God, Hannah's testimony will just spark a fire within them. We give you the praise and the glory for what you're going to do through her testimony tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So my name is Hannah Gonzalez, and um, I just want to start off by saying how great God is. Whenever I was going over this last night, I couldn't help but reflect on my past, um, where I was in my past, and to where God has brought me today. I still stand amazed. The goodness of God and His mercy are like no other. It blows my mind that Jesus would take my broken life that was in pieces and put it back together better than I ever could have imagined. And He wants to do that with yours, too. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you, God, for your faithfulness and goodness, Lord. I pray that tonight, God, whenever, uh, Lord, that you just touch hearts in here tonight, God, Lord, I pray for salvation. Um, I pray for uh, people who, who maybe have turned away, God, to turn back to you, Lord. And um, I just pray that you take the gates of hell, Lord. Use, uh, just change people's hearts tonight. Psalms 34.4. I sought the Lord, and He answered me, and He delivered me from all of my fears. Six years ago, Jesus used freeway ministries to get me down here to Springfield for treatment. I was born and raised in Jefferson City by a single mom. By the time I got down here, my life was completely miserable, and I was a total mess. I was, a full -blown, I was in full-blown addiction, and I was an IV drug user and a huge alcoholic. I had lost everything that ever mattered. My addiction had led me to abandon my kids and my ex-husband, my husband at the time, and turn away from anybody good in my life. And somewhere in there, I totally lost me. I don't really know what I believed before hearing the truth and getting saved, but I think it went something like this. I believe I'm a good person, and if there is a God out there, I would go there. Or I would say I'm sorry on the way up because he's a loving God, and I would be accepted in. What lies I told myself. This is how God pulled me from the pits of destruction and saved me. I had always had addictions since I was a child, but as I got older, they had influence and taken over every aspect of my life. When I was young, I got put on Ritalin for ADD, and by sixth grade, I was snorting them. I think it started me to liking uppers. My mom likes to tell stories of me being brought home at the age of 11 by parents because I had raided the liquor cabinet. My addictions caused a lot of friction between me and her. I was very hateful and took out most of my rage on her. It's hard to hear things like she kept life insurance on me because she thought without a shot of a doubt I was going to die. I came close many times. I've overdosed a few times. I've had guns held in my head, and I've been raped. By God's grace, he allowed me to wake up, and I'm not spending eternity in hell. My friends were dying all the time. I felt like death was chasing me, and I knew it would only be a matter of time. So I started at a young age drinking, smoking pot, cocaine, boys, skipping school, sneaking out, pretty much doing all the things you're not supposed to do. Since my dad was not around, my mom really did try her best to console me and keep me safe, but I was good at pushing her away. She tried counseling in juvenile, and I was heading out of control. One summer night, whenever I was 13, I snuck out of my house and I went to a party. Little did I know that I would not leave the party the same way I came. 
Whenever I walked in, I was handed some Everclear, and before I knew it, I was waking up totally disoriented in a bathtub naked. My friend had gotten the guy off of me, but it was too late. I had been raped. I went inside my house and put it as far back in my brain as I could. Then I just never talked about it. I pretended like it never happened, but inside I felt broken and ashamed. I started dating a lot of boys, looking for love. I dropped out of high school, and I moved in with a boyfriend and got my GED. When that didn't work, I moved to Kansas City because I'd met my dad. I'd always wanted to know what he was like. He was the opposite of my mom. My mom was the head of the probation and parole, and my dad was more like me. I could drink and do drugs, and it was okay. At 17, my addictions really started to affect my life. I got arrested for my first DWI, the first of four. I hit another car and totaled mine. I lived there with my dad for a little while. Then I met another man who was pretty rich and a lot of fun, so I moved to Chicago with him. All of that was before I was 20. At 20, I met my ex-husband and became or, uh, my ex-husband, my husband at the time, and uh, got pregnant with my son Nicholas. This was an exciting time, but everything was moving so fast. I quit doing drugs whenever I found out I was pregnant, but as soon as he was born, I was right back to crack and alcohol. I didn't even breastfeed because I knew I'd be using, and I was. When I went to the doctor for my six-week checkup, I got the news that I was pregnant again. I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know how to be a mother to this little boy, and now I was having another one. At the time, I believed the way the world was that it was okay to have an abortion. I had never opened up my Bible to see what God said about human life. In Jeremiah 1.5, it says, I knew you before, before, and I formed you in your mother's womb. I kept drinking and doing drugs because I was sure I was going to have an abortion. But by God's grace, I knew, uh, by God's grace, before I knew it, I was too far along. So I quit using uh, drugs and drink, and I was so thankful that my daughter, Kayla, was born perfect and vibrant. The next few years were hard, but we stayed together as a family. My addictions were always causing fights. I started lying about everything, where I was going, who I was seeing, what I was stealing. I was always caught up in my lies and my cheating. My binges started to be more drug out. They would last weeks before I would come home. And then came heroin. This was my first big step to my real bottom. I'd always taken pills and dabbled in heroin here and there, but this time was different. I shot it up, and it made my whole body feel great. I always wanted something that that, uh, made me feel that way. I was always searching for the best drugs and the most I could do. I ended up leaving my kids and my ex-husband to live with a guy in, in his parents' basement's house. I remember knowing at the time that it was wrong, but eventually that feeling left. One night, I OD'd all the way. I woke up in the hospital with my chest and body aching. They had done CPR on me and shot me up with the stuff. I put on my wet clothes but because they had poured hot and cold water on me, and I went back to the same place and did the same thing that I just almost died off of. That's when my friend said I could have woke up in the Missouri River. Finally, I decided to get treatment. I decided, that method, I decided to go with methadone. At the time, I thought methadone had saved my life, but it, that's not true. But I was able to go back to my kids and go to hair school. I still partied a lot with crack and alcohol, and I was able to function. I was on methadone for a few years, but whenever I got off is whenever everything went downhill. I quit cold turkey, and you're not supposed to do that. I felt terrible and wanted to use. That's all my mind could think about, so I went out and I met a man who I thought was nice. Everything about him was normal. We went to his friend's house, and we partied and did drugs throughout the, that night and day. But then their attitudes started changing. They were becoming mean. They were victimized, and he told me that he shot me up with HIV and made me sleep with him. I was thinking I was never going to leave this house or see my kids again. They had my ex-husband pay for me back. He took me to the hospital where I was screaming, I have HIV. I got tested, and by God's grace, I did not have HIV, but the whole situation really messed with my head. I had a new hatred that ate me up from the inside out. And even though I loved my, my husband, I couldn't stand to be touched by him. I fell in a deep depression that, that drugs couldn't even block out. I started to spend a lot of time away from home, and I got fired from my job. I would come home, but it would be to only rest, because I was so exhausted and I needed to change my clothes. I can only imagine what was going on in my kids' heads. My thoughts were ter- terrible, and I wanted to kill and hurt those guys, and it constantly went through my head. 
I felt guilt and shame, and I was in a very dark spot. I was on all sorts of medications. I had medications for anxiety, for depression, to go to sleep, medications to not dream. I would have nightmares that I could not wake up from, and my screams would scare my children. One day I needed money. I saw an ad on a computer. I called it. It was a well-known escort prostitution house in Columbia. It only took 20 minutes for them to come pick me up. When he arrived, I had already made up my mind that I was going through with it. I shut my front door, and I didn't look back. That first night, I made $2,200, and that's where I stayed for months. I went from working at a number one hair salon in Columbia to becoming a prostitute overnight. I would spend every, mu- every penny on drugs. I had missed birthdays, Thanksgivings, and holidays, and I had abandoned my children again. One night, the police came to the hotel that I was at and ran everyone's name, and they got to mine, and the policeman said, Hannah, you know you have a missing persons report out on you. I realized then how long it had been since I had talked or seen my family. When I, ca- when I would call home, the answer machine would say, if this is Hannah, you can still come home, but I just couldn't. The drugs and lifestyle already had too much of a hold on me. I didn't want my kids or family to see the monster I had become. The lifestyle I was living was 24-7 sex and drugs. My life was not a life anymore. I wandered like that for two and a half years with no direction and no hope. I surrounded myself with very bad people and put myself in a lot of scary situations. I somehow ended up with a, a man, pimp, that was so controlling and very abusive. I constantly had black eyes. He would beat me with a belt, and he put holes in my hair. I was becoming a shell of a person, and I barely recognized recognized me anymore. One night in particular, I found myself with someone I didn't know, and he tried to rob me, so I thought. He hit me so hard. I definitely should have been knocked out. When I looked down, I was mortified. He had rubber gloves on. I remember thinking someone was going to find my od or murdered body in one of these nasty, cockroach-infested hotel rooms. This time was filled with terrible physical and sexual abuse and a lot of bad experiences. My ex-boyfriend got out of prison, and I moved back to Jeff City. I thought I would slow down on drugs and quit prostituting, but it just didn't work out that way. I just started doing the same thing from his house, but now we were racking up a lot of felonies. We went on the run, and we didn't make it too long. My son went back to prison. Now here I was, alone, no family ties, no good friends, and have lost every moral I had ever had. I was addicted and ready to give up. I went back to the dirty basement and absolutely nowhere to go. Before my friend went to prison, he would talk about John Street and how he changed in prison, how he had gotten saved, and started this place called Freeway and became a pastor. I tried, I was trying to watch things about Freeway and I was trying to read the Bible, but none of it was making sense and it scared me. I had nowhere to turn. John, I, I got John's number and I texted him and I told him I lost everything I loved to drugs, that I needed to find out more about Jesus because I had tried everything else. I tried in AA, move in jail, drug court, methadone, suboxone. John asked me one question. Was I willing to do whatever it takes? I was, I was ready. I told him I surrender. I put it in the Lord's hands. I'm willing to do anything and everything. And I knew it wouldn't happen overnight. From that moment on September 17, 2014, I never used or had sex again. I know God has given me the strength because he picked me up and took me to the courthouse a week later. Took picked me up from the courthouse and brought me down here to treatment. I got there clean. I hadn't been clean since I was a kid. The next day I got to go to Fairway, and that's where I heard the gospel for real, shake my heart. Anyone could have told me I was terrible and I didn't care, but whenever I saw my sins, my lying, my stealing, my abortions, my terrible ways on the cross, and I saw what Jesus did for my sins, my heart was pierced. I went down to the altar and I cried out to Jesus to forgive me, to forgive me, forgive me, to save me, and guess what? He did. When I got up, I got up a new person. God says, I'll put in a new heart and put in a new spirit. I will remove that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, 26. And that's exactly what happened. That old Hannah died that day. And everything about me changed. I wanted to know everything I could about Jesus because he freed me from every addiction, mental illness, and torment that was in my head an eternity from hell and replaced it with true peace and joy. My life changed from this point on. I became alive in him. It has been a beautiful six years with Jesus, clean and sober, which is only because of him. 
Over these years, the women at Freeway taught me how to live on the foundation of Jesus Christ, how to walk a Christian life and be a godly mother. My kids have lived with me for the last five years. The Lord allows me to work with women who we do discipleship and we get to learn the Bible together. I also teach a Sunday school class for women with my best friend, Amber. She helps sharpen me every day, and I thank the Lord for her always. Find friends like that that help sharpen you every day. Normally, when there's no COVID, we get to go take a Bible study into Carol Jones Treatment Center in Polk County Jail, which there's nothing better. And not too long ago, Jesus allowed me to go to Cape Town, South Africa to share the gospel. My life has been forever changed. I just finished my second, or in the middle of my second year of Bible Baptist College, which itself is a miracle. <laughs> um, if you would have told me or could have told me that this would have been my life, I would have never believed you. The gospel is so powerful. Do you know Jesus? Do you have a real relationship with him? Because if you don't, don't wait, because he is so good. It was worth it, wasn't it? Come on. Praise the Lord. When we have people share testimonies, they don't ask to share testimonies. We ask them to share. Because we know they're the real deal. And Hannah, you're the real deal. And I'm so, so, so proud of you, sister. Like a daughter, I love you so much. And uh, just excited to see what God's going to do with you when you graduate Baptist Bible College. Amen. So if you would turn your Bible to Acts 16, it's amazing how God's sovereignty works because I, I, this, is not, this is not the sermon I was going to preach. Uh, the, my brother Tim can tell you that I asked him to switch the sermons because I felt led to preach this. And, um, and then they sung the, so, the songs, went right along with the message, and it's just beautiful. So if you can and you would, when you get to Acts 16, would you stand? We'll honor God's word with that. We're going to read it start in verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in prison, committing them, commanding the jailer to have them keep them secure. Verse 24, Acts 16. Having, such a, having received such a charge, he, the jailer, put them into the inner prison, and he fastened their, their feet to stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing that the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword and he was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we're all here. And he brought, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and, your, and you will be saved in your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to them and those who were in the household. And he, and he took them that same hour, and he washed their stripes, and immediately he baptized. He and his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced, having believed God with his household. Father, I pray that you would bless your word. I pray that there's somebody here that's lost, that they would come to know Jesus. Revival, I believe, is for the church, Lord, so I'm preaching to the church tonight. And I pray you stir our hearts. What a wonderful testimony of Hannah. As she was sharing, I just had to bow my head and pray for you to protect her, Lord. Because she has such a powerful testimony, the devil hates that. He wants to destroy Hannah. So have your hands on her and these other women that are with us today for the program. And I just pray, God, that you destroy us up today. Help us rejoice and praise God tonight, no matter what the situation. Father, could we see revival happen? Could we see an awakening come? Would you pour out your spirit on this church tonight as I preach? Help me stay out of your way. I don't want to add anything to the text, and I don't want to take anything from it. In Jesus' name, amen.
You can have a seat. Thank you. So as we talk about this sermon, and we talk about this text, the context of the sermon is Paul did not want to go to Philippi. Paul, Paul is not going to Philippi. This is where this happens in Philippi. That's where the church of the, the Philippians, you see the letter of the church of Philippians. This is who he writes to, this, this group of people. But God called him to Philippi. Paul didn't want to go there. He's making plans to go to a place called Pergia in, in Galatia, and, and the Holy Spirit stops him from going. And, and Paul sees the vision of a man crying out and, and, and asking for help and saying, Come to Macedonia and to help us. And this is the reason he's in right now. And, and Paul knew that God had other plans for him. And so, so he goes there. And, uh, well, everything turns good first, you know. I just, just imagine for a second, Paul and Silas are together. They're on a missionary journey. They know God has sent them to this place. They know they're in the will of God. They land. They get off the ship. Uh, they, they, they meet a rich lady named Lydia. Lydia is a uh, lady who's, who's, who's got some finances. We found that out later. She's selling purple, uh, selling uh, clothing, purple clothing, and she's... He meets her, and, and, and this lady, she, 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 they talk to her about Jesus, and she comes to faith in Christ, and she says, come to my house and, and stay with me, and let me, let me bless your ministry. Let me, let me be a part of that. And, and so Paul and, and Silas go to her house, and her family gets saved. And everything's going good. And then there's a demon-possessed girl, and this demon-possessed girl following them around and kind of annoying them, and she's like a fortune teller for these her, her slave masters. And Paul delivers her from the demon, and then his slave masters get mad because their money's gone. And the slave masters get upset, and they begin to cause problems, and they have Paul and Silas thrown into prison. And that's where we're at right now as, as, we, as we're there. Let's just kind of place ourselves today tonight. Paul and Silas have been beaten. They, they've been beaten with rods. They've been stripped naked. Verse 22. Verse 23 says they were whipped. They were put into prison. And if it wasn't bad enough, the jailer said, put them in the inner prison. You know what the inner prison is? The hole. How many know what the hole is? Yeah, there you go, Clayton. You know what the hole is. I've been in the hole. The hole is prison in prison, right? It, it's a place inside the prison. It is the prison inside of the prison. It's the dungeon. So now listen. They're, they're beaten. They're whipped. They're stripped naked. They're put in the hole. But guess what else? They're in stocks. They're being tortured. Now, 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 just just put yourself there. This is a first century dungeon. There's rats. It stinks. There is, there is no rules, right? Everything goes. They're sitting down probably on the concrete with their feet in stocks, maybe their hands in stocks, naked. They're blackened, bloodied, ribs are broken, humiliated, dragged dried blood on their face, they can taste it in their mouth, their lips are busted. It's so dark you can't see in front of your face. You know what I think they did? I think they wept. I'm just being honest. They're human, right? I believe at first they were weeping. They were thinking, what, what is going on? Why would God allow me to, why would God send me here for this, right? Here I am, I, I'm, I'm, I'm put in a place where I'll never share the gospel again. What's going to happen to my life? They questioned God. They struggled to breathe in those wooden stocks. And something happened to these men. Somehow they begin to worship. (laughs) Somehow they begin to sing. Somehow they begin to sing songs of praise. And then those songs of praise turned into prayers. And and, and it says they sung hymns. And they they begin to pray to God. And and like my pastor said, they begin to pray. And they begin to worship. And they begin to sing songs to God. The angels of God begin to stomp their feet to the beat. Amen. And and, and, and 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 the jail shook. And the doors came open. And everyone was free. And, and God moved, and and, 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 and and we had revival break out inside of this prison. And so all, everybody just wanted to know about Jesus. And, and, and so as we see this through this prayer and this worship, how God breaks out and revival happens in the worst situations, here's a question for you tonight. Who was in prison? It wasn't Saul. Or excuse me. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't Paul, and it wasn't Silas. Who was really in chains? It was the jailer. He was in chains. They were free. Right? They were free. Imagine the scene. The jailer comes running into the prison, 
somehow Paul knows he's about to end his life, and, and because when you lost prisoners, you faced your punishment in, in, Roman, in the Roman law, and, and somehow Paul sees that he's about to kill himself, and I don't know how Paul sees, because it's dark, it's so dark that you can't see in front of your face in this prison, but somehow Paul sees him, and he, and he says, wait a minute, don't do it, we're all here. And the jailer's thinking, where did that noise come from? Because he couldn't see. It says he had to get a light. So he gets a light. And he runs down the hallway, and Paul leads him and his family to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what can we get from this text tonight? Here's the first thing I see. People are always paying attention to the Christian. Always. Did you know that? People are always paying a Christian attention to the Christian. Do you know what comes with a spotlight? A magnifying glass. A magnifying glass. Especially in ministry and as a pastor, you're, why, people watch you for everything you do, everything you say, and they watch your kids and they watch your family and they're looking for something negative. I tell people all the time, if you're looking for something negative, you won't have to follow me because, because I make mistakes. I'm a person, right? And, and, and I reminded when Freeway Ministry started, Earlier on in 2011, I met these guys at a coffee shop. <clears throat> one guy's named Mike A., one guy's named Rick Lechner, and one was a, uh, a U-plus truck driver. He still is today. He drives a truck all around. I call it the Brown Church uh, because everywhere he goes, he shares Jesus with everybody he comes in contact with. He's on the north side of Springfield sharing Jesus with every package he delivers. He's been doing it for a long, long time. And, and then Rick Lechner, he's a diesel mechanic who's now doing our Freeway Ministries, he's a Freeway Ministries Omaha. But I'll never forget this. Here I am, a single dad, fresh out of prison, uh, just got out of a homeless shelter, and now I'm, I've got a little boy, I'm, I'm on my own, I'm preaching, and and, uh, and, and Freeway had just, just started, and, and uh, so it hadn't been that long. And Mike Carey had been accused of, of uh, not following procedure when he dropped some packages off, and and uh, the UPS has a union, and they have their own kind of court system and everything. And the last three or four guys that went to, went to court for what Mike was going to court for were fired. Mike's daughter, Macy, had braces on her teeth, and they were being separated. She had to have them adjusted, or they were going to mess them up. And I knew all this was going on. When they fired him, when they put him on leave without pay, they took his med- Medicaid, medical insurance away from him. And so I knew what was going on behind the scenes, and they didn't have the money to get the braces fixed. And as he was waiting to go to trial with UPS to figure this out, you know what he did? He praised. He worshipped. He got a job laying towel. I remember on Wednesday nights at church, he'd come in last minute, he'd come in right before the service started, and he would have grout. He has hairy fingers like me and Pastor, and... Uh, He'd have that grout caked all over his hands and on his eyebrows. He didn't have enough time to go home and take a shower. He'd still be dirty from work. And I knew what was going on in his life, and he never complained. He never said anything, and he would just be raising his hands with that dirty, sticky grout all over his fingers, worshiping the Lord and praising God. And guess what happened? He got his job back. They they never fired my kid. And, And I'll never forget this with all my heart. It made an impact on me. What happened? He praised his way through. He worshipped his way through it. He never let it stop him. He continued to pray. He continued to worship. Imagine Paul and Silas beaten, whipped naked, harnessed to these stocks. They could have been complaining. They could have been moaning. They could have been uh, doing anything. But they started singing. They started praising God. They began to sing hymns, the Bible says. They cried out to God and the, the other prisoners could hear them. Man, can you imagine that? I bet there were some prisoners saying, shut up! With all that cushion stuff, we're trying to sleep. They were singing so loud, everyone in the prison began to hear them worship. Do you have a song in your heart? What are you going through right now? Do you have a song in your heart? They didn't have lights to see. They didn't have screens to read from. They begin to sing. Maybe you're suffering tonight. Maybe you're going through it. Right now, listening to the sound of my voice, you are chained to a situation. Something has got you bound right now. It seems unbearable. You're shackled. 
You're bound by something. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe you're trapped in darkness. Life has you stuck in stock. Some tragedy has happened. Do you have a song in your heart? I love what Charles Spurgeon said, uh, friends. He said this. He says, any fool can sing in the day. It's easy to sing when we can read the notes by daylight. But a skillful singer is he who can sing when there's no light of ray to read. Songs by the night come from the Lord, and they are not in the power of men. What songs were they singing? singing? Have you ever thought about that? I bet it might have been Psalm 42, verse 8. By day, the Lord commands His steadfast love, and by night, His song is within me, a prayer to the God of my life. Maybe it was Psalm 56, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I I don't know what they were singing, but these men were singing and praising the God. And, And what happened? Everyone knew it. Everyone was witnessing this. And so Christians are always being watched by people, no matter what the situation may be. So remember your testimony tonight. And the second thing is this, Christ will build His church. Christ will build His church. There is no accident. There is no coincidence. I serve a sovereign God. And my sovereign God, I'll tell you this morning, He's never late. He's, he's never in a hurry. He's always on time. There's nothing He doesn't know. That's my God. And nothing strikes Him by surprise. And so He is always building His church. Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Don't miss this. The enemy wants to lock, lock us up, shut us up, get rid of us, but he can't. So what happened? He said, put them in a hole. Lock them up where they can't be heard. What they do, they started a prison ministry. They started a prison ministry right there in the prison, just like John MacArthur said on, on, uh, on, on the news. He said, I'll start a prison ministry if they want to lock me up for going to church. That's what I'll do. I've never done that before. No matter what man wants to do to stop God, then he will fail. Now, I just want to give you something to think about this, this, this afternoon, evening, whatever it is. When you read the book of Philippians, how many know what the book of Philippians is? You ever read that book? Let me tell you the church, that's the church of Philippi. Who's Paul writing to? A slave girl who was possessed by a demon. A male man named Epaphroditus. A rich woman in Lydia in her house. A mean old jailer who got saved in his family in a prison ministry. This is the church of Philippi. And, and so when you read that, that's, that's what God was doing here in the, in the text. He's, he's building his church. When you walk in the church of Philippi, you see a little piece of heaven. It reminds me of Freeway Ministries, man. People gathered together that have nothing in common but Jesus. I don't want to join a, a biker church. I don't want to join a black church. I don't want to join a white church. I don't want to join a Hispanic church. I don't want to join a Native American church. I don't want to join an addict church. I want to join the church of Jesus Christ where we're all together and we have nothing in common but Jesus from all walks of life. Right? These people were put together by God. Jesus was building His church. One day as I was reading the book of Acts and, 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 and going through the book of Acts and thinking about all the things that God did. And I read, I read, the, I read the day of Pentecost how God interrupted Peter. And then I read the Mount of Transfiguration where God interrupted Peter. And then I read about Cornelius and how God interrupted Peter. And I thought, man, I want to be like that. And so I began to pray. And this is a dangerous prayer. I dare you to start praying this way. God, interrupt my day. Interrupt my day today. When you pray in the morning, God, interrupt my day. I began to pray that way. Well, I had a man named Tuan. He was a Vietnamese immigrant. In our program, the court gave him to us. And they paid his fee every month to, to stay in the program. And, and uh, so we took Tuan, and, and I didn't notice about his culture, but they're very superstitious. Anything I gave him, he kept. And he wore it all the time for good luck. And so we gave him, we gave him for Christmas, we gave him, some, I gave him a, stocking, a stocking cap and some other stuff. He kept that stocking cap on. And, and he came to the freeway, and we have a clothing ministry, and he got a trench coat in the winter. Well, it's summer, and he's still wearing the trench coat, and he's still wearing a stocking cap. And you know, that's just the type of guy he was. But through the process of the time, Tuan, he began to get kind of disrespectful and, and uh, threatening. And finally, I had to go get him. And I went out to Marshfield, Missouri, picked him up, took him to the courthouse. I took, I took Tuan before the judge, and I said, Judge, this is what he's doing, and we can't handle him anymore. So they incarcerated Tuan right there in the court. I felt bad for him. He didn't have nobody. They said, what are we going to do with all this stuff? I said, well, I'll keep it in my garage without asking my wife. And um, 
So the day I said, Lord, interrupt my day, I began to pray, Lord, interrupt my day. <clears throat> the social worker from the Green County Jail where we're at in Springfield called. She said, we're ready for Schwann's stuff. Would you come to the jail? I had other plans. I said, fine, I'll come to the jail. I went to the jail. I waited out in front of the jail. She came out. She said, where's the stuff? I said, it's not something I can just hand you. It's a whole trunk full. <clears throat> she said, I'll meet you out there by my car. Go on the other side of the parking lot. So as I'm standing there in front of the jail, here comes this guy. He says, hey, are you the preacher from Freeway? I said, I am. He said, I go to that Friday night service. He said, you know what? I think God wants me to start and help start a youth ministry over there and reach the kids. Yeah. Would you allow me to help you do a youth ministry over there? I said, cool, man. Talk to me about it. Here's my card. And I gave him my card. And as I walk across the street to pop my trunk, a plumbing truck stops in the middle of the parking lot, jumps out. This guy comes running up on me in the plumbing truck. I'm thinking, we're about to fight. I don't know what, what's going on here. He, he, he says, hey, I, just, I want to talk to you for a minute. He says, my name's Joe. I'm a plumber. He said, I come to that freeway service. He said, I grew up here. He said, I just wanted you to know that you're making a difference in our community. And I appreciate what you're doing. Matter of fact, if you ever have any plumbing issues, here's my card. I'd like to help you guys. By that time, the social worker's there, and this guy, Joe, is helping me unload Twan's stuff from my trunk to her car. And as I'm talking to him and her, there's another guy standing there waiting to talk to me <laughs> in the parking lot. Like the pastor does after church service when people, he's just standing there waiting to stir. And I'm thinking, Dad, what are you doing? And, and the Joe leaves, and this guy's name's Randy. And Randy comes up to me. He says, John, I, I just, my name's Randy, and I just left the jail. And there's a young man in here that I feel like I, I, I played a part in his drug addiction. He's in jail, and I got saved, and I gave my life to Jesus. And, and I just want to reach out and talk to him, and I can't. He had a big stack of papers, and he said, they told me I have to fill all this out and do these things in order to go see him. And I, I go to Crossway Baptist Church. I called Crossway and asked them what to do, and they said, call John's group, and he'll help you. He said, I was going to get in my car to go to Crossway to get your phone number, and there you were standing in the parking lot. What was God doing? He was building his church. That day. He was interrupting me to do it. What was he doing with Peter and our Paul and Silas? Building his church. The last thing I'm going to say tonight is this. When Christ wants to set a man free, he sets him free. He don't try to do it. He doesn't. Who really needed to be free? It wasn't Paul and Silas because they were incarcerated but free. It was that jailer and his family. No matter what you're going through right now in your situation, maybe you're chained to something, you can be set free. Christ can not set you free. He doesn't have to try. He can do it. The Bible says this in John 8, 13. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I wish I could have seen the face on that mean old jailer as he heard Paul's voice cry out from that dark dungeon hallway, Hey! Don't harm yourself! We're all here! Just thinking we're all here. The doors are open. The doors are open. He says... He calls another jailer, and he calls another jailer, and he says, get me a lamp. And as he lights the lamps or torches, whatever he used, and he went down that dark hallway, all he seen was these prisoners everywhere. Paul, naked and beaten, red marks on his handcuffs, of where his handcuffs were, red marks on his ankles where the shackles held him down. All the prisoners could escape, but what did they do? They went to Paul and Silas. Why? Listen. Because Paul and Silas had something in prison they didn't have. And they would rather be incarcerated in a prison cell and be set free, be, be out of prison, and not have what Paul and Silas had. The jailer said, I want what you got. How do I get it? What they have? They were broke. They were beaten. They were naked. That salvation. What must I do to be saved? Nothing. Believe on Jesus. The work's been done already. 
Notice the change that takes place in the, in the jailer's life. It says that very hour, that very night, he grabbed that wash rag and he began to clean their wounds. Then he takes them to his house. He gathers his kids together. He gathers his wives together. He, he, he gathers the prison guards together. And Paul begins to share the gospel with them. And the jailer comes to Christ and his family comes to Christ. Man, what an awesome experience. What happened in there? Listen to me. Don't you miss this? We're about to close. Revival broke out. Revival happened. Had it happen with praise and prayer and worship. I wonder if we call this worship team up here and we begin to worship together as God. The angels of God will begin to tap their feet in this room and we'll see somebody set free. I wonder if we can have revival happen in this church tonight. If we begin to truly worship God, if we, if we begin to truly pray and cry out to God in this room, I wonder if revival will happen like it did then. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Every head down, every eye closed, just listen to me for a minute. Pastor Charlie, I ask you to come up here to the front. I believe there's a believer in this room tonight, a Christian, and you're chained and bound right now. Did you know that praise and worship can shake them chains off? You come down this altar, get on your face before God, and just raise your hands and begin to worship Him. Just like it did then. When's the last time you truly worshiped God? I mean, met with Him. That's revival. Meeting with God in true worship, love, and adoration of Him. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not a believer. You've never truly been born again. You've never truly trusted in Jesus and been radically changed, and you know it. With every head down, every eye closed. If it's tonight's tonight, you want to trust in Jesus, just put your hand up to it back down and say, pray for me. That's me, preacher. Tonight's tonight. Amen. I see you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? I want to trust in Jesus tonight. That's me. I'm like the jailer. I look like I got it going on on the outside, but man, I'm chained up, and I want what you got. I'm going to lead you in a, in a prayer, and then I'm going to encourage the church to respond. You need to trust in Jesus. Repeating prayers doesn't save people, but believing and confessing Him with your mouth does. So I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. You can pray with me. If you mean it in your heart, Father. Tonight I'm under conviction. I know tonight that if I died right now, I'd meet a devil's hell. Tonight I want to trust in Jesus. I'm a sinner. I know I've sinned against you, and Jesus has come to set me free. I want to ask you to come into my heart tonight. Be my Lord and save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, for those that raised their hand in this room, I pray that they would be brave and bold enough to come and meet me and Pastor Charlie right down here in front so we can counsel them and and nail this thing down with them and you tonight. And they can walk out of this place knowing they're free. Father, for everyone else in this room, the Christian that's bound, the person who hasn't ever, hasn't worshipped in so long, their situation's getting them down, God. They may be chained to something, but if they'll just come, even, even get on their knees in their seat and just meet with you and begin to praise you and begin to worship you because you are so worthy, Jesus. And you would take the chains off them tonight. God, would you do what years of therapy can't do? Would you do what medication can't do? Would you give somebody a real, a real breakthrough tonight in this room? And we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand tonight? These altars are open. If you need to deal with God, would you just come, church member, Christian, find a place to meet with Him and just begin to, just begin to worship Him, just begin to praise Him. Begin to pray to Him. If you raise your hand as trust in Christ and you pray that prayer, me and Pastor Charlie are going to be down here. We'd love to talk to you. 
Be brave and step out from where you're at right now and come.